Hello, welcome. Can everyone hear me? Everything good here? Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for joining us today. My name is Julie Hubble and I am an 87 and I live in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And today is primary day in New Hampshire and I have my I voted sticker on um, as um, it's fitting because it's uh, representation is the topic that we're actually going to be talking about today. Today, the topic is representation matters, the importance of representation in literature. And I am so pleased that Professor Alexander Chi is here to moderate a panel of Dartmouth authors and illustrators. I have been looking forward to this conversation for a very long time. So I am so glad you are all here to listen in. So let's take a moment to be present and take a deep breath and put our feet on the floor and relax our shoulders and take a breath. Talking about representation, issues of identity and inequity can sometimes be emotional. I'd like to encourage everyone to listen fully, suspend judgment, and be open to new ideas. We begin this session with the reminder that Dartmouth is situated on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki people. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous people, and Dartmouth's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. So this discussion will be a little over an hour to have time to answer some of your questions at the end of the panel discussion. Let's move on to the slide that says, who is DAPA? What is DAPA? For those of you who may not be familiar with this acronym, it has way too many A's in it. And it stands for Dartmouth Asian Pacific American Alumni Association. So it's D-A-P and three A's after it. It represents all Asians at Dartmouth. And Asians have been the largest racial student affinity group at Dartmouth for the last 20 years. And we re routinely represent 15% of the student body. DAPA has over 8,500 members, and the class of 2023 added 200 more, more alums to our roles. DAPA is the host of this event tonight, and there are a number of people behind the scenes, and I want to thank all of them for their work in bringing this conversation to you. Okay, the next slide is a quick commercial. <laughs> This coming May, we will be celebrating our 25th anniversary. Today's event is part of a series of virtual events leading to our in-person celebration in Hanover on May 3 through 5, 2024. With special guests George Takei and Helen Zia, we are hoping many of you return to celebrate with us. You can see that we have a number of past events which are very interesting. And if you go to the next page, you will see our fantastic website, dapa.dartmouth.org. You can see the amazing programming we have created for that, that uh, reunion weekend, along with links to all the virtual events that have been recorded. This event will be posted there later this week for you to share with others. Dapa dartmouth.org. Check it out. All right, we'll go ahead and start with the programming now. I'd like to now introduce Alexander Chi, Professor of English and Creative Writing at Dartmouth. Born in Rhode Island, he lived in several different countries in his childhood, including Korea, Kauai, Truk, Guam, and Maine. He attended Wesleyan University and the Iowa Writers' Workshop. 
winner of numerous accolades, which you can read on the screen. He is the author of best-selling novels, Edinburgh and The Queen of the Night, and the essay collection, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, all published by Mariner Books. Described by the Washington Post as an essayist with virtuosity and power, he was the guest editor of the Best American Essays of 2022. His voice and his insights have been representing minority groups for his whole illustrative career. Thank you for moderating this discussion today, Professor Chi. And now I will introduce all the um, authors. First up, we have Francis Cha. Francis Cha is the author of If I Had Your Face, which was named one of the best books of the year by Time Magazine. In addition, NPR, BBC, and Esquire magazines also had it as a, as a must read, and it has been translated into 11 languages. Next up is Megan Kakimoto. Megan is of Japanese and Kanaka Maoli, Hawaiian um, descent, and the author of the story collection, Every Drop is a Man's Nightmare. It is a USA Today national bestseller. We're so delighted she's here. Next is author Linda Sue Park. And um, I will confess that Linda is my sister and I had to twist her arm to be here. Linda is the author of many books for young children, including the 2002 Newberry, Newberry Medal <clears throat> winner, A Single Shard, and the New York Times bestseller, A Long Walk to Water. She is also the founder and curator of Alita Books, an imprint of HarperCollins. And lastly, we have Min Le. Min is the award-winning author of picture books, including Drawn Together and The Blur and the Eisner-nominated Lift. He also has illustrated graphic novels such as Green Lantern Legacy and Enlighten Me. So thank you all for being here today and I will hand the conversation over to Professor Chi. Excuse me. Um, hello everyone. And uh, thank you for taking some time uh, with us uh, this evening to think through uh, some of these issues and these stories together. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, to be the moderator uh, for this panel and to also just uh, think about um, uh, the power of this group and the power of this alumni panel uh, simultaneously. Um, it's a it's a terrific example to uh, the students who are at Dartmouth now. So uh, thank you to our panelists for, for doing that. Um, I thought I would uh, start off tonight with, uh, with a question to the group, um, which has to do with uh, has to do with how uh, how seeing a particular uh, example of either positive or negative representation for uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander folks uh, affected your approach to writing. Uh, and so I thought maybe I would start with um, with Megan, if you feel ready to take a shot. Yeah, thank you for the question and thank you all for being here with us. Um, I think thinking about this question, the very first thing that comes to mind um, is a positive representation of sort of uh my own sort of native hawaiian upbringing um 
and that was in uh, Christiana Kahakoila's collection, This is Paradise. Um, and that's just a book that has meant so much to me for the last like nine plus years um, in terms of the way that her stories captured um, life in Hawaii that was not, that didn't feel to me like it was pandering toward any particular audience other than the people the people in our communities. Um, and I felt like the honesty of Christiana's representation of a lot of the issues that we still kind of face today in terms of land displacement and, you know, water relocation and um, people just not being able to afford to live on their homeland um, felt as relevant 10 years ago as it does today. And I think that's just a book that has really meant a lot um, in terms of my own trajectory as a writer um, and as a reader as well. Uh, thanks, that's a beautiful example, actually. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Linda Sue. Um, it's, I'm trying to train myself not to think in the binary so much. This is so hard, it's so hard. I mean, that's how we're all raised, right? Um, so when I saw, uh, and Alex very kindly, oh, should I call you Professor Chi? Is that what I should say? <laughs> you can call me Alex. <laughs> um, we go Alex, way back we to go way. Rochester in 2005, <laughs> which there is no time to explain that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I am the oldest panelist by by a good a good piece here. And um, when I saw Alex's question, you know, he said positive or negative, you know, impact on your own writing. And I thought about a third option, which actually is negative, but I didn't think of it that way at the time. And that's sort of a null, if you will. They're just there may have been some representation of Asian Americans in children's books when I was growing up, but they did not reach my library, my uh, Midwestern suburban library or classroom. Any books that there were, um, were written by a uh, dominant culture, usually white people. Um, and you actually end up internalizing that in this way. I never expected to find any books on the library shelves you know, with, with the Asians in them. It wasn't that I thought, it, what, it wasn't like an angry thing. Oh, I wish there was some, I didn't even know that much. You know, that's that's how much that the, the dominant culture had just, you know, inculcated me that, you know, why would there be books about Asians? You know, and and when you, if you think about that, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to do to a kid, right? Um, the subliminal message is, you know, you and your people and people that look like you are not worthy of literature, right? But once again, I didn't perceive it as a negative at the time. It's just the way it was. And it took me a really long time to get angry about it. I am very glad I did, right? And of course, I have seen a lot of changes over the years. Um, we still have a really long way to go. And um, right now, uh, my impatience is with a lot of the back padding going on in publishing. Oh, yes, now we're diverse. Well, actually, no, you're not. <laughs> but um, certainly progress has been made. And um, my books, Francis's books, Min's books, and as they grow older, um, um, Alex and Megan's books and Francis's adult novel, um, they are there, not just for the kids that look like we do, but for everyone to say to everyone, well, yeah, everybody's story is worthy of attention, you know? And so, and if anything, I sometimes think that it's a more important message for the dominant culture to receive than it is for marginalized people, because we know that already, you know, so. Yeah, I, uh, you're making me remember actually when you say that, that I think maybe the first images I saw were like in Tintin comics. Ah, yeah. Like, uh, you know, like I, it was really in the 1970s, um, you know, wasn't, it wasn't until like maybe I got to 
uh, Korea and visited uh, like as a teenager and saw my uh, my cousin's books that I saw something that looked recognizable to me, you know. Uh, Min, what about you? Um, yeah, now a lot like Linda Sue, it's one of those things where like you don't know what you're missing until you you find it, right? Um, but for me, the book that kind of I always point to was one of the few picture books, and this is a negative <laughs> purpose, this is a negative example, um, is the the five Chinese brothers. Um, because that was like one of the few instances of any Asian representation in books when I was growing up. And it was one that was used all the time. And for me, it was really powerful because I did kind of absorb some of the imagery and some of the um, messaging from that because there's a, I grew up in suburban Connecticut, I actually grew up in, what, in Middletown where West End is. Um, and in my class, there was me and uh, my friend who's Cambodian, we're the only Asian kids in the class and we would get confused all the time, right? So the message in Five Chinese Brothers of these five brothers who were virtually identical and like no one could tell them apart was something that like that message of we do look practically the same was this kind of something that I internalized growing up in school in so many different ways. So I think for me, that lack of any kind of robust representation or and was important because also when I was younger, you don't have anything else to tie, hold on to. So you kind of like, you hold on to whatever representation you see, even if it's negative, right? And the way that shapes you is, is interesting. So I think for me, if you ask about how it's informed my writing, it's just like, I love putting stories out there and seeing all the stories out there, like all of yours that kind of like flesh out our humanity for on the page and on the shelf. So um, it makes me really happy to, to see a panel like this. Um, and to know that the shelf is so much richer than it was when when I was young. Your work in comics, I think, is also got to be interesting. I mean, first of all, uh, writing the Green Lantern is something that I didn't even know I could dream about doing when I was a kid. So, like, I don't know if you have anything uh, anything to reflect on there in particular about. Yeah, no, um, thanks. That that was like a dream, a, pro a dream come true. And um, DC Comics invited me to pitch a story when they were starting a new imprint for young readers. And Green Lantern was a character I was familiar with, but not one that like was like my my character, right? But when I was reading it this time and thinking about like a character to write, there's something about the character that kind of like hit different because it's about someone with a really strong willpower and a a green ring, and it made me think about my grandmother who is one of the strongest people I know and always wore a jade ring. So I wrote this story about kind of like in tribute to her and kind of mm. recasting the immigrant refugee story as one of a heroic story, right? So it meant a lot to me to be able to step into that world and to do so in a way that it was honoring stories I think were often told, like Linda Sue was saying, from the dominant perspective and in a light that I don't think is reflective of the true heroism and humanity that exists in, in that type of journey. So, so yeah, it was really fun to write too. So, so thanks. Francis. Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, I, I remember emailing you, Alex, and saying what, how my life would have been so different if you had been a professor when I was taking creative writing. I'm sure we all think that way. Um, I was a creative writing major and an Asian studies double major. Um, and I would say I never, of course, never saw any Asian representation in the books that I read for English. But on the Asian studies side, I remember reading uh, a book that was that really caused a huge uh, paradigm shift in my my brain which was Diary of a Madman by Lu Xun. And we read it in, in Chinese. It was a Chin in our Chinese language class. And the, it's a historical text uh, featuring a very unhinged narrator in, in China. And I found that so delightful, the fact that uh, we could have such a complicated, complex character. I, I remember when I was reading um, for pleasure at Dartmouth, 
and I would read in Sanborn. Of course, there's no, you know, Asian representation in Sanborn, but um, the books that I would read. Oh, I, I remember taking crime fiction for a little bit, and there was Agatha Christie. There are a lot of references to Chinamen as a passing reference. Um, they're always very silent and mysterious, and of course, um, second tier, uh, and hardly a um, rounded character, let alone an unhinged one. And I often find that I feel the most inspired when I, I find these um, unhinged, unhinged characters in fiction that are Asian, because I feel this freedom, because I do think, I'm sure we all feel this as Asian creatives in, uh, as a kind of a minority, but I for one feel so much pressure um, of representation. And I, I am the most aghast when people say, oh, you know, your character is representative of the entire female Korean, you know, society. And I, I think that's absolutely not true. Um, it's a character, it's an extreme character. Of course, we carry universal truths in our fiction, but, you know, having that burden of representation is, um, makes it kind of very stifling in a way. Um, so seeing that in my Asian studies class was, was so wonderful. Um, and positively impacted in my writing. And, but I grew up, since since I grew up in, in Asia since I was eight, it was interesting to learn the different stereotypes that Asians have in America when I, when I came here um, for boarding school, because I wasn't quite aware of, you know, what stereotypes were attributed. Uh, and I would learn through, through fiction children's fiction, um, especially where you have occasional references um, that were quite negative, uh, especially appearance-wise. Uh, a lot of it was mocking or dark hair. And it's not just Asian specific, but golden hair is obviously aspirational in past children's literature versus mousy brown hair, you know, mousy brown eyes or dark eyes, dark dark skin is negative. So having that, um, when I reread my, to my children books that I enjoyed um, as a child, I, I find myself very horrified of all the internalizing that I must have done uh, and kind of rapidly curate my, my shelf. But it's, it's still, I don't know, a huge issue because when I even when I go to my friends houses and I look at their shelves and I say oh can and these are Asian friends with children I say can you name an Asian American children's author and they really can't so it's I think the awareness um, of how every consumer choice is a is an, a, an act of activism should really be more <laughs> aggressively pursued by writers I think something that I would uh, that I would so first of all I I know I've had that experience actually reading to my nieces and nephews where uh, this was a, over a decade ago and I actually just edited the story as I was reading and then resolved never to read it to them again. <laughs> but I was I was like uh wow i i did not remember that at all um uh and it, i think what's hard in those moments right is the the way you flash back to when like maybe even a memory you haven't had since when you were a kid and you read it like the sense of like how you how you did or didn't really handle it you know um running into it uh but i was i was thinking i wanted to quickly address the sandboard issue is an interesting one um because uh i don't know if i mean i know i'm speaking to largely an alum audience but um as a library sandborn is a browsing library which means that nothing can be checked out it can only stay in the library and the, the books there are very old 
Um, and I don't know that they have been refreshed recently. Uh, there's been some conversation about addressing that. And I think, uh, I think we are going to be addressing it soon. And certainly if alumni are activated to, uh, to participate, we would, you know, welcome book donations, uh, when, when the time comes, but, um, you know, it would be nice to create a sort of like Dartmouth authors section, for example, um, that would be a lovely thing. Uh, Alex, to that not, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, when you get to that point, be sure to enlist a bunch of children's librarians because they battle with this every day, school and public. Um, weeding mm. the shelves and um, adding new books, but the reluctance to get rid of books that meant a lot to them in their childhood and the whole nostalgia factor, you know, mm. oh, yes, that was a great book, but we need to get rid of it now. And look, this is what this one's much better. And it is a tough road to hoe. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that advice. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to move us to the next question. One second here. Do, do, do. Uh, book bans are a response to the increase that there has been in uh, diversity in publishing. Uh, have any of your books been banned in this most recent wave? And how have you responded as an author? Linda Sue. Yeah, um, I've had uh, books banned um, because there are, you know, librarians love lists. So there are librarians, um, prominent ones, or committees and organizations who make lists of quote unquote diverse books that they recommend for purchase by libraries and schools um, for the librarians who simply don't have time to read everything and just want to know what, what the approved or the better stuff is. So because my books are on those lists, what happens in places like, as you know, um, certain counties in Florida or Texas, the whole list just gets banned. Nobody looks at the individual books. They're just like, oh, if they're on this list, they must be something that we won't like, <laughs> right? And so they just ban the list wholesale. So um, uh, again, because my books and men, men's probably too, right? Um, have, are on those lists, they just, they get banned. So, um, you know, I've done, I've done the things that you do, which is to join whatever efforts Penn is, Penn is, uh, Penn America is um is doing and then i actually went down to address a school board in florida and wow what an experience that was um so uh and and you know i said most of you will not know me but i have won a prize called the newberry which some of you will know and um you have easily in this list it was a list of 100 and 170 books that had been um bought the collection the entire collection had been purchased um, and then stored um, once the school board members decided that, oh, we can't have these diverse books on our shelves. Um, so uh, I said, you have Newberry winners, you have Caldecott winners, you have people who have won many, many awards um, um, on this list. And of course, the whole school board was shocked because they had never read or looked at them. So one of the things I find frustrating is there is no, it, it's like, with other population segments, especially politically, is um, reason has no place in the argument. There's no saying, you know, oh, please read this book. I am very tired of people saying, oh, but they haven't even read it. That is part of the point. They will never read it. Stop saying they have to read the books because they don't. They don't care. They don't care about reading them. It's just the principle that if this book is, you know, ethnically diverse or or um, especially in Florida, the um, LGBTQ books were that they were especially vociferous about those. Um, so I hope, you know, I, I mean, there's days when I feel so tired and so discouraged and it's just like, oh God, you, you younger people, you do this, please. I'm just too tired. <laughs> um, and yet um, there's no option, right? You just have to keep doing whatever it is you can do and hope that this is um, a wave of madness that is currently gripping the country. I like to think of it as the flailing of a dying beast. I hope that's what it is. Um, um, uh, but, um, you know, there, there's just, 
you know, I just have to keep visiting the schools who will invite me, which are fewer and fewer these days. Um, and and uh, changing I mean, from my friend, what my friend Jack, Jackie Woodson says is changing hearts and minds one reader at a time. You know, it just seems like it, it's not it's never enough. But the what's the option to quit? We don't have that option. So. Yeah, no, I'm I'm kind of in the same boat as Linda Sue in that my books when they're banned, it's because they're just being swept up in part of like a, a list that's being sent to the side. Um, and there's a certain kind of privilege with that because we have so many friends who are like being specifically targeted for their books and receiving death threats, being called groomers, being like living through this like this nightmare, right? So being having a book banned but not targeted, I think, makes you want to be in a position to to push back because we have a little bit more bandwidth than someone who's fending off threats every day, right? So Linda Sue and I are both involved in an organization called We Need Diverse Books, um, which is part of the movement to have diversified the shelf. And I think you're seeing a lot of the bands being a pushback against the progress that has been made. And part of what we're trying to do now is not just continue to expand the selection of books that are out there, but also kind of protect the progress that's been made because it's being threatened every day, right? So whether that's providing support for uh, marginalized authors, trying to give resources and support to teachers and librarians who are at the kind of bearing the brunt of this wave right now. Um, I think for all of us who kind of like live in this literary ecosystem, it's like it's important for all of us to, to play whatever part we can to push back because there's some of us um, who are just like really struggling right now and like doing their best, but it's 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 hard out there right now. What are just uh first of all uh before we get to uh Francis and Megan I wanted to quickly just say thank you for doing that work but also like if people wanted to get involved uh how would they get involved what are some ways that you might tell them to help out um uh, Linda, so you might know even better than I, but like you said, PEN America is doing such amazing work kind of tracking this issue and kind of being at the forefront of all, anytime something pops up, I feel like PEN America is there. And We Need Diverse Books is trying to provide like some backdrop of support for, for everyone in the industry and everyone in ed education to make sure that they they have the support they need. And so they're always constant, they're constantly running different initiatives. They have a new initiative called Book Save Lives to try to show the value of diverse books or um, show the value of ensuring that every reader has the opportunity to to have a selection of books, right? And a lot of times you know, the book banners out there are talking about like the importance of parental choice, but they're the ones who are limiting choice for families. Right? They're the ones who are limiting the ability to find the books that kids need to, to read. And you never know um, which book is going to save someone's life, right? Like one kid out there might need this one particular book that book's not going to be for everyone, but for that one person, that could be a, um, a truly life-saving experience. So I'd say those two organizations are a good place to start because they are they kind of have their finger on the pulse of what's happening and they're tracking everything. And they have staff devoted to making sure that they're meeting the moment and, um, and they just have great resources to plug into. Um, you know, I think of the ways that people usually give, which is money or time, you know, that's how, that's how you can contribute, right? Um, skills, if you have certain skills, but it's a highly local issue. So if you live in a problematic county, run for school board. I am not exaggerating. I have a friend, Cody Miller, who works very hard on LGBTQ issues, and he quotes somebody, and I can't remember who I'll get from Cody, who says, I would rather have 100 school boards than 50 senators, okay, in terms of shaping what's going to be happening, right? And if you don't want to run for school board, show up at the school board meetings. Okay, there are more of us. There really are. Actually, there are way more of us, right. but more of them show up to those meetings and make more noise. So, you know, grab five of your friends and tell them to grab five of their friends if you live in a problematic part of the country and go attend the school board meetings. It really is huge. It really makes such a difference. And uh, out of those 170 books, after the Florida School Board meeting, 117 of them were returned to the list, okay, because there were more of us there. 
However, it was a bittersweet victory because the 60 some books that were left off were the LGBTQ books, okay? The ethnic quote unquote books got put back, right? So we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, uh, Francis. Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> Are you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah, Linda, Sue, and Min are such giants in the field. Um, it's, I think it really starts with children's books because, you know, children are a blank slate until they internal, internalize all the biases that, that come from the generations before. Uh, and as this country's just getting more and more divided, it's it's really just shocking. And it's it's a subject that's so large in our lives as writers but i feel like the general public especially the asian american general public is actually not very <laughs> aware of it because we are um you know very busy in our lot in the, our day to day so whenever i speak at these i you know the the aapi diversity um panels i'm usually met with absolute incredulity they just cannot believe it and they think it must be very problematic um books and that's not true it's just a book about dim sum it, it being banned <laughs> on long island you know it's not it's not some wildly inflammatory content that's being banned it's just the the concept of having a diverse storyline so um trying to reach those who are not as uh you know, I mean, all of the writers can recite the stats um, the, and joining PEN America is a, and donating to PEN America is such a wonderful oh. way to do that. I was part of the host committee um, last year for the new, the new year and just the stat statistics that are being, you know, updated every year, it's getting actually worse and worse and um, it's, it's really hard to believe it's very dystopian, but uh yeah it, it i think for me personally um i've been uninvited to school visits i've been told afterwards oh we have considered and we we've, we've decided that your book is not um exactly what we're looking for and there's someone else who might be more appropriate for our audience and i've kind of n noticed geographically it's it's from schools furthest from the city center. Whereas of course, uh, cities are, are being much more diverse or are much more welcoming in terms of school visits. So that's just been very interesting um, to experience uh, as a debut children's writer. So, yeah. And Francis brings up a really important point about school visits because What's happening is that the the ripple effect of these bans is that it's creating this um, environment of fear for educators, right? And they're worried about if I invite the wrong person, all of a sudden I'm going to have this avalanche of um, kind of like hate thrown at the school and like bureaucracy and just like, and so when you have the kind of like silent banning of just like books not being purchased, um, authors not being invited, you're making it so much harder for authors of all backgrounds to have a career, to like even make a living. Because so many, especially children's authors, supplement the often meager royalty statements <laughs> with like school visits. And if you can't do that, then if you take out that revenue stream, then you're gonna struggle to pay the bills. You're gonna like, there's so many kind of cascading implications of this current moment. And so, so yeah, that's a really good point that you brought up. Ian. Yeah, I mean, so much of this really is resonates with me, and I'm so grateful to be having this conversation. I think, you know, for me, um, this collection is my first book um, and has not been banned to my knowledge. Um, but, you know, in addition to being a writer and being a teacher, um, I also am a bookseller and a part time uh, book buyer. And uh, I've been really, you know, proud of the ways that sort of both myself and my fellow book buyers here um, at our very humble shop in Honolulu 
have been actively stalking titles by Asian Pacific American writers uh, that have been banned or challenged. Um, and these are by far our most popular titles, which is both exciting and, um, you know, uh, we'll have community members come up to us and thank us for stocking the books because they haven't been able to access them elsewhere. Um, and that's, you know, exciting, but also kind of painful to sit with sometimes. Um, and I think that if anything, I think this collective dedication in my kind of small community here um, to championing banned and challenged books in this way has always been really heartening to me. Um, because it feels, at least it can, it can feel for me like a very small effort, a small thing, but I think that's something, Linda, see what you were saying about, you know, one reader at a time, uh, that, that really kind of hits home for me um, in my day-to-days at the bookstore. I think the um, part of it is about raising awareness, right? Like, there's, uh, as you said, Francis, like so often incredulity that uh, is offered when describing these, even though I think it's in the news a lot. Um, uh, it's always a good idea to find out like what's going on in your town, who like to talk to your community. Uh, what are the forums where people meet about these things? I was really proud of uh, of the state of Vermont recently when uh, in the school board elections, uh, the book banners were defeated in the election. Like that was a pleasing thing. Um, uh, and that was when I started to check in because I think, you know, I, um, there's a reason I live in a town of 700 people in the woods of Vermont, you know, <laughs> like, um, uh, I, I like a certain kind of, uh, distance from the world at times. Um, but, uh, you know, but we all live in a community, whether we know it or not, and whether we participate or not. And it's always worth figuring out, like, what can I do? How could I, how could I go talk to a librarian and find out what they need? You know, how could I, uh, how could I maybe run for something? There's even an organization called run for something where if you decide, say you want to run for some kind of local office, they will help you, um, with that. Um, and I think it's also good for all of us to like, take a look at our bookshelves and just ask ourselves, like, you know, that's a very easy thing you can all do tonight after this panel is over is ask yourself like who's on my shelf who am i reading and who am i not reading like and uh how could i how could i like one way to change hyper locally is literally in your own home like uh you know and to, and to read a book by a writer you've never encountered or to uh to find say like uh, some of the books by these uh, amazing writers on the panel and to give them to some of the people in your life who um, who might be appropriate readers for it. Um, it's uh, everything from something small like that to something much bigger, you know, like. Uh, so we are, uh, we are definitely making use of this time. Um, the next question I have here is, uh, what are the stories you feel you are still looking for? I wonder if you have a sense of that. Like, I think I have, just as an example, this has been an incredible year for Korean American writers and readers uh, and anyone who, who loves those books, uh, 30, six titles have come out in the in 2023 uh from korean american writers um of various kinds at least 36 that's not even an official tally that's just me and my like i have a korean american facebook group by the way for writers called fourth kingdom um uh and 
you're anyone who uh is in the audience who's uh korean or korean american is definitely like welcome to join us um but uh but yeah it's not even an official i'm not a scholar uh of this particular category um i am a scholar just none of this anyway uh so I, I'm still taking in, I guess, what we have, what's what's been arriving. Um, but I wondered if uh if any of you have like a sense of that. Uh and I'll, I'll yeah, to Okay, go ahead. What were you gonna say? <laughs> no. Please start. Um, I'll, I'll I'll get the ball rolling in that I would love to see more just like silly stories from from our community out there. I think Part of the thing is that with publishing structure the way it is, there are certain kinds of stories that we're often like, um, the publishing wants to see, right? And coming, having just spent time in the, the comics world, the way I describe it to people is like, I feel like our community a lot of ways is like, has been in a stage of writing our own origin story on the shelf and like making sure that we have a place on the shelf, right? And what I love to see now is kind of like, now that we've established that, like, just like spread, like have writers to spread their wings and write whatever they want, like silly stories, like sad, sad stories, like just kind of like take the reins off and um, and kind of see where you can take it without having the pressure of being like the book to represent, like like you're so saying, um, like Francis was saying, like the pressure of like having to like be the book to represent your community, right? It's like now that that pressure is hopefully kind of dissipated, what can you just play around with and what stories, what genres do you want to experiment with? And, um, and I think having new imprints like Linda Sue's are going to be a, play a big role in that because now like we have people within the community in positions of, of power and influence that can kind of like push back against kind of like the old school publishing tropes of like, oh, we want this story from this community, this story from that community, and just give um, writers a little bit more space to, to be creative and so. Well, that, thank you for that segue, Min. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I have a publishing imprint, a teeny tiny one at HarperCollins called Alida. Alida is a Korean word that um, I like to say the equivalent of the French voila. It means, you know, announcing or here we are. Um, and um, I am supposed to curate a list of four titles a year. Um, it is not an exclusively Asian imprint. Um, that was a tough decision to make, but we finally, um, our, our, um, our mission statement is um, to amplify marginalized voices, whatever community they come from. And it's exactly what Min said. Um, I want to, um, I want to push away the walls of what kind of story is acceptable. Um, I want, for all of us, ethnicity is part of identity, but not the entirety. So it's that, you know, those are the kinds of stories that I want. Um, and I want stories that are more granular, that, you know, if you think about um, the stories about the white experience, there there is absolutely everything and there is overlapping everything, right? Um, and that's what I, that's what I want from um, people from marginalized communities is not only their passions, their silliness, whatever it is they want to write, but um, just uh, just to give you one example, um, I have a book coming out that was um, inspired by um, the wonderful books that have been published over the last five or 10 years about black hair right? That black hair was such a negative and that nappy was almost like a curse word, nappy hair. And yet there have been a whole bunch of books come out celebrating black hair, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do one about Asian eyes, right? And mm -hmm. um, Joanna Ho has some wonderful books there for older readers. I have written a book called Smiling Eyes, which is for very little babies, little children. Um, I have a, another book for that age girl called Bibimbap, and so I was writing this book about smiling eyes, called Smiling Eyes, for the very youngest, um, the very youngest readers. And we were looking for an illustrator, and we wanted an Asian illustrator. But I said, it can't be an Asian illustrator from Asia, because they will not have the experience of being mercilessly teased about their eyes. I need an Asian who grew up here in the United States and has that experience so that they know, you know, what I what I'm trying to do here with this story. Right. So it's a, just a very simple example of how we all know that not all Asians are alike. <laughs> 
<laughs> in you know and and just to get to th that kind of um to get the, down to that kind of of granularity with the different stories right so um to remove those expectations of what you know um i mean remember with my 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 very first book um and this was published in 1999 so it was a very long time ago and the editor who was doing her best at the time um, said, can you put something about Asian New Year in there? You know, um, <laughs> I mean, that was what was, you know, except let's do, let's do the holidays. That's the, that's, um, that's what's acceptable. That's what a dominant culture audience is comfortable reading. Right. So um, I'd love to publish books that, um, that the dominant culture will not be so comfortable reading, but um, may eventually enjoy and certainly learn something from. Uh, Megan. Yeah, I think this, I love this. I think it's like, I'm, you know, for me, I am constantly desperate for works by indigenous Hawaiian writers. Um, uh, reading a Hawaii written by Kanaka Maoli and, you know, I, I really get excited about sort of what Min was saying about even about just like silly stories too. And I think that there's this, this um, what we've been talking about throughout uh, this, this last hour um, and these pressures of representation. And, you know, there's so many, um, there, there at least that I've encountered a lot of expectation to write a particular story, a particular quote unquote Hawaiian story, right? Um, and of course there is a, so much pain around the illegal occupation of our land um, and so much to sit with there. And at the same time, there's just a lot of beautiful joy in being Hawaiian and being in community with other Hawaiians. Um, I've only sort of been privileged to that joy recently since moving home uh, after a few after years away as well and just um, remembering that like that silliness and that pleasure and that joy doesn't negate the pain, but it also deserves space. Um, and I think just the only way to access that is to just make room for more Hawaiian voices and more Hawaiian books. And I think that's just something that I am constantly on the lookout, trying to champion and really just committed to uh, seeing uh in the world yeah just a, one thing too what they made me think of to clarify my earlier point about like the origin story aspect of it i didn't mean to necessarily imply that that work is done or that those stories yeah. don't need to be told anymore it's like there's so many communities that haven't had the opportunity to tell like the the fullness of their story but mm -hmm. as we kind of get get out there i hope like linda said is that we'll have space for the totality of experience and including all of these stories as well as we move forward so that we have space for everything as opposed to just a narrowly defined literature. Yeah, I completely agree. Francis. Sorry, can you hear me? Um, yes, we can. <laughs> yeah, um, just getting rid of all the boundaries and quotas and, and gatekeeping and and the idea of what an Asian story looks like, like all of that, I, I heartily agree with. I, I also do notice though in my in my teaching, so I teach um I teach in the MFA program fiction workshop, and I, I am noticing these days that my students are very terrified to write about anything that does not show their immediate direct story. Uh, and that is this um, almost a kind of a censorship that's also occurring as a kind of an unintended um, in effect of that, which I find very interesting, but you know, it, it becomes a slippery slope as well. So I hope that, you know, we, it's a, it's a complicated issue, but just, trying to get rid of the story that we think we have to write the thing the story that we have to represent on behalf of our people um that kind of boundary is something that i hope we can move past um 
and this is coming from someone I when I'm on submission I routinely get get um, feedback like oh we actually have a very similar story coming out next year and then being very petty I, I kind of track it and see what what's coming out and it turns out to be a totally so mind's you know, <laughs> Chinese I don't know Chinese American woman from Idaho I, you know what I mean and to those um, non-Asian gatekeepers that's a very similar story and that was uh, it's just very frustrating from a creative standpoint um, being kind of pigeonholed and I really welcome all kinds of neg not negative but very uh, diverse representation of Asian characters especially for example terrible reality TV what was the the really wild bling empire things like that <laughs> you see Asians not only being you know the model minority you see them being very brash and and breaking all stereotypes um you see them being villains or petty all, all all types of representation that's what i really really hope for in you know children's literature as well as to echo min all the silly stories um and adult francis literature. you have said something really important when you were talking about the non-asian gatekeepers which is that we tend to think about the creators and sometimes we even go to you know the the prizes and the workshops and the fellowships and things like that. But the gatekeepers and the people in um, writing adjacent work is so important. You know, with Alida, I'm constantly no, I want I want a marginalizer, an a Asian copy editor on this book. I want an Asian production manager on this book. Okay, and it's really hard. Right. Um, there's a lot of Korean Americans and other Asian Americans on the design and graphic side, which is terrific. Right. But in sales and marketing and publicity in the higher ups of, of, you know, so it's so important that we work on that in book selling, in teaching, in reviewing um, all of these positions. It's a whole infrastructure. It's not just, hey, isn't it great that in 2021, a Korean American won the Newbery Medal? You know, it's not it that that's the you know, let's pat ourselves on the back and, and publishing and let's look for the next one. No, there's so many structural changes that have to take place. We Need Diverse Books has an internship program, which is really important to me, um, where we fund internships. We, well, the internship has to be paid by a publishing company, but we provide a supplemental grant so that non-traditional applicants can live in New York City, right? It has traditionally been a very white middle-class um, cohort that has gone into internships because you have to have family help if you're going to live in New York City, you know, on whatever minimum wage, right? So our grant means that some people who might not be able to take the job can now take it if they share a house with 11 other people in Red Hook, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so it, it's like, we're not just trying to change children's books or literature in general, you know, we're actually trying to change the world. And this is really, really hard work. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. It is really hard work. And that is a really powerful uh, step to take that I didn't know about that uh, fellowship. And I hope for those who it might apply to that, uh, that they, they apply to it. And actually, I will tell students about it as well. Um, so thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to uh, turn to them first uh, from the from you all in the audience. Uh, but I would also say just please uh, put some more in the chat and uh, and I'll also go back to. Um, I still have more questions uh, uh, if, if we don't get more questions uh, from the audience. All right, so first up, um, let's see. How do you all regularly engage with other Asian, Asian writers, BIPOC writers, LGBTQ plus writers, and similar populations? So I, uh, for example, um, I, I created fellowships uh at two different organizations uh i fund on them 
Uh, one is uh, for Asian, Asian American, uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander writers, uh, queer writers in particular, sorry, at the Lambda Literary Foundation. And it is named for uh, Justin Chin, who is a, a queer uh, Malaysian American poet who also spent a great deal of time in Hawaii and uh, who was a friend and a big influence on me when I was uh, younger. And he died uh, very young a few years ago. And in his memory, I created this fellowship with another uh, friend of mine who had been a former student of his. Um, and this is the kind of thing that I always thought that I would have to be very rich to do, like at least a millionaire to do something like this. And actually, I'm still not a millionaire. And uh, and the way that it gives back to me to fund this and to see every year the, the writers that we give this fellowship to find Justin's work and uh, and then they've started getting their own book deals. That has been an incredibly powerful experience. Um, another organization I work with is Kundiman. Uh, I donate to their, uh, to their programs as well. Um, they're a wonderful national Asian American and Asian writers organization. Uh, and also the Asian American Writers Workshop, which is a very, uh, very older and established, uh, organization. I, I donated and participated in their programming also, and uh, I've been a member uh, for a very long time. Um, so uh, those are three groups off the top of my head, Lambda, Kundiman, and the Asian American Writers Workshop. I also donate to Kaveh Kanam, uh, which is a Black uh, poetry uh, collective. Um, that's been a fantastic uh, way to to give back. Many of my friends uh, are poets who came through their programs. And, uh, and so it was a no brainer to, uh, to donate money to them. Um, and, uh, and they are, uh, they're just a really exciting group uh, to be connected to. Um, so those are some ways. I mean, I think, you know, other ways are like, I just, have a lot of friends and I <laughs> and I see them which is part of why I hide in the woods for part of the year but um uh but that's you know that's part of it inviting them to campus also having them as guests here or as part of other programming that I do in other ways um you know those are some ways that I do it uh I just want to jump in to say yes Alex, jump in Alexander is known as kind of the godfather of all Korean and Asian American writers because he is so vocal and such a generous soul in regards to casting some of his incredible light on, you know, debut writers and people who are really struggling to get their stories out there. Same for Linda Su has her um, Kibuka. I don't, I don't know if you've talked about that, but uh, highlighting you know, all the Korean American children's writers out there according to um, age level and just doing- oh, Yes, please put a link to that in the chat, somebody, if you can. Yes, absolutely. And Min, oh my gosh, Min is posting regularly thing, and just being such a champion in his own way, contributing to anthology. He, the, I, It's kind of wild to me that all of you have a Dartmouth connection <laughs> and um, it's such an incredible- you know, uh, it, it, this is such a wild conversation to me. So, you know, thank you for all that you do in, in kind of championing voices. Um, I, re I appreciate the question because I think that um, I have a similar problem to Alex, but with a different cause, which is that all my life I've been very socially awkward. And um, I am, and so that means that the idea of, building community is something terrifying to me. How the, how do you do what, how do you, I don't even know how you do that. 
right? Um, but I would say that there are organizations that are a great help. For me, initially, it was SCBWI, the Society of Children's Books, Writers, and Illustrators. I'm no longer involved with them, but I was for quite a while. And then We Need Diverse Books come came along. And um, that was actually key for me because people were having the kinds of conversations that I desperately needed and provided me with opportunities to do that and language, the language to express to people, you know, uh, the often the rage that I was feeling, you know, um, but mm. um, so I would say you have a, you're here tonight. You're here at this depa thing. <laughs> and uh, that's that's a place to start, you know, get get involved here. Come to the events, ask if you can help. And that can be a way that you meet a few people here, there, on, online has been a boon for people like me, um, you know, um, and who can, um, you know, do things like either text or email or whatever, uh, do th and, and, and try to get rid of the awkward stuff before I actually post. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, uh, so there's definitely, um, you know, the, the thought of building community by yourself is, is very scary. So um, as Alex was saying, use the groups that already exist you know, um, and they can be a great start. Yeah, and I'll chime in, Francis, you're too kind, of course. Um, but I think for me, I'm like Linda Sue, I was incredibly shy, incredibly awkward as a kid. I see my sister, V, class of 2003 is on the call, so she can attest to just how shy and awkward I was growing up. But um, what I tell kids a lot of times about, about being in this community is that for me as a kid, books were my escape from the world, right? I didn't want to talk to them. I was like nervous, didn't want to talk to grownups, didn't want to talk to other kids, but I could always escape within the, the pages of a book, right? Um, and what's amazing, and I don't take for granted now, is that as an author, I feel like for all of us, books are our way back into the world, right? Because we put these books out there, they give us reasons and excuses to, um, to connect with people. And that's the beauty of putting these books out there. So being at conferences or being at festivals, um, it's just such a wonderful thing to be in community with people who kind of are committed to the same type of work and the same type of, um, it, and it's, it has to be as bleak as the world often is. It has to be, you have to approach this work with a certain level of optimism and hope to be putting work books out there for people to read. Cause if you had no hope, there would be no point in doing this. Right. <laughs> um, especially when you're writing for kids, I feel like, so for me, the world of writing, especially for children, has given me so much that I love nothing more than to try to welcome other people into the space and try to make it as welcoming for other people because I would love nothing more than for up and coming writers to, to benefit from that same space, right? That has meant so much to, to all of us. So I think when you're stepping into this community, this community is kind of, um, kind of like this like self-perpetuating machine of like people wanting to lift each other up. And that's just a beautiful thing to be a part of. Yeah, I found the same exact thing. And I think that's, I've, I've always said, just like putting out this first book and the biggest privilege has being, you know, being exposed and being able to do events just like this and being able to meet writers that I've always admired and is, you know, just dreamed of being in conversation with and also just meeting readers from across the world um, who are also craving Asian books and Pacific Islander books and Kanaka books um, and feeling that sense of sort of that for me is a sense of community as well, even, you know, from sort of a distance. And I, I am also someone who is incredibly socially awkward still. And I am I I've also found that community is so vital for me but I like to do it on a smaller scale sometimes. I think that's what where I feel really comfortable. So a lot of my attempts at trying to build community here in Hawaii has been like awkward fanning emails to writers who live here, who I know that like I'm maybe just completely um, unhinged in my excitement to to just tell them how much I love their work. And, and a lot of times that's led to friendships and I've, you know, become dear friends with a writer here, Joseph Hahn, who has just been an absolute admirer of his work for a very long time. And I feel like if I didn't kind of make that first step, however awkward and uncomfortable that had felt, um, I would have missed out on a really great friendship and a great element of community here. So um, 
putting myself out there a little more has has had a I'd say a really wonderful effect on um, cultivating a larger literary community in Hawaii. Megan, you should put in your bookstore so that people can. I would oh, love yeah. to. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thank and anyone who's in Honolulu, come and buy books from our independent bookstore. It's called The Shop. But that, um, that does go back to something Alex was saying about, you know, your micro locale. Um, during, when Black Lives Matter uh, first came to prominence, um, I said that for a year I was going to read nothing but books by Black women. And um, and I was already reading some books, but I just made it a conscious choice that that year, anything I bought or got from the library. And of course, it was like, it was an incredible year of reading. It was just fantastic. And one of the things that I do is that when I come across a book that I love, I buy a few copies and I give them to people, right? Um, that That's just, that's the kind of thing you can do just to be more conscious in your choices. Here's another really simple one. When I travel, I go on the website and I look up um, black or minority owned restaurants and I eat there. You know, uh, somebody had said earlier, the consumer choices you make can make a difference. And that's another way that you can contribute or you can help in the fight. Well, that's excellent. I'm sorry to break into these wonderful questions and answers, but it is time for us to wrap up. I really appreciate all the information that these authors and Professor Chi have discussed in front of us. Um, the insights were really amazing from talking about the dominant culture's portrayal of Asians that have shaped us all um, and that um, the progress being made in putting more diverse books on the shelves needs to be protected uh, because our librarians and our bookstore owners are really struggling to keep diverse books on the shelf. Um, and this whole idea of um, a silent ban was, uh, was uh, powerful, uh, that it is affecting the livelihood of our creatives by this fear. Um, and then the, the conversation about how to put into action uh, ways to support uh, other uh, minority groups and uh, marginalized uh, uh, people who um, within publishing and the entire pipeline from uh, the creative to the agent to the marketing and the publishing and the editors, uh, it's really important. Um, and to you know vote with your feet and actually put your dollars into action is a good reminder for all of us. Um, so thank you once again to all of our uh, speakers tonight. It's just been wonderful hearing your insights. Um, and um, just a little reminder that um, uh, we do have a resource guide available um, and we're putting that into the chat and it will also be on the DAPA website uh, so um, you can see a list of recommended articles um, and uh, books and uh, books by these authors. And um, lastly, we hope that you come to Hanover for the 25th anniversary event in May. Um, early bird registration deadline will end on February 9th. So that's the best price. And hotel reservations are open now. So please go to darkgo.org slash DAPA 25th to register. Um, or if you have any questions, uh, go to dapa.dartmouth.org. And if you'd like to volunteer and help, as was recommended, please email the uh, email address listed below. And thank you once again to all the speakers and organizers, to DAPA and to all of you for joining us in this fantastic conversation. Good night. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jaden. <laughs>